Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, as we continue our study of the path into Christ from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, the path into Christ. We have been discussing how a person can go from being what we see at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 2 to being in Christ. And this passage, these 10 verses, tell us what that path is. Every single person starts in the same place. Now, what I didn't clarify last week is when I said everybody starts at the same place, I was it sounded like I was implying that everyone throughout history starts at the same place and when they believe they're placed into Christ. In Christ, being placed into Christ is uniquely a New Testament thing. Old Testament saints were not placed into Christ. They are distinct in that sense. They had salvation. They came to God the same exact way, faith in the Messiah. They looked forward to the Messiah. We look back to the Messiah. We know his name. We know who he is. We know what he did. So they had a forward-looking faith, and they were saved by grace through faith, but they were not placed into Christ. What we have is an entirely... I guess I'd just say a whole nother level of blessing because we are actually at the moment of salvation, spiritually speaking, God takes us and immerses us into Christ Jesus so that we are one and identified with him perfectly and consistently. We're even given his righteousness. When God looks at us, he sees his own son, not because we deserve it, but because he freely gives it because Christ was such a perfect savior. So how do we get all of that? Well, he had to start somewhere. So Ephesians chapter two, the beginning tells us we were dead in sin. This speaks to a position. Our position, when we start, when we are born into this world, we are separated. That's what death means. And the place, the realm in which we exist is sin. That's all there is. Our position is separation and a sinful reality. And then it speaks to our practice in verse 2 when it says, in which you formerly walked. This is activity, walking, things people do. The life that they live is a way that this is speaking of. So what we do, the way we walk, is our practice. And if we're dead in sin, that's the realm in which we exist, we're separated from God, the things that we can do, we can only draw from things that exist in that spiritually sinful realm. We can't draw from the life of Christ. We can't draw from an in Christ position. We can't draw from heavenly blessings. We start off totally separated from those things. And so there are three sources that can make us act and do things, spiritually speaking, before we're in Christ. And the first of those we've dealt with for a number of weeks here. It's a very important one, though. And that is the way of the world. The way of the world is one source that gives us the ability to engage in activity spiritually. And it's a terrible source. It provides horrible things in the life of unbelievers. So the way of the world we've discussed, basically the way of the world has the same goals. It's that which we see in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 16. There are three things that the way of the world wants, or that the world wants, and that their path is trying to lead to. They want the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. And they are working over time to get those things any way possible. They will never achieve what they think they want, but they're not going to stop trying. Only Christ's return will put an end to the world system engaging in this process. But throughout history, there have been three main ways, three main philosophies that have been used to try to achieve those ends, those pleasures that they seek. And the first one that we talked about most of human history is what was called pre-modern, before the time of modernism, when man believed that he no longer needed to appeal to deities, no longer needed to believe in gods, no longer needed to believe in the supernatural and believe that he by himself, without God, could achieve utopia on this earth. That's the modern age. But before that, people did appeal 
and think about things from a pantheon of gods type of perspective. Why does it rain? Well, there must be a god of rain. Why do we have sunshine? Well, there must be a god who is the sun. That's the way most of pagan, mystery religion, pantheon type of religions worked in the ancient world. And that goes all the way up until about the 1500s. You have a number of features that change that world. And one of those is that, strangely enough, the Bible got in the hands of people and people started to be able to think for themselves. Many people became believers. And with this, there were all sorts of innovations, but those innovations caused man to become arrogant and the modern age set in. Now, what we have been discussing is the modern age is really, even though pre-modernism, this sacramental type of thinking, thinking that you can earn God's favor by your works and rituals, that's still with us. Modernistic thinking, thinking that through just learning about the world and science and gaining knowledge and innovation, we can achieve everything we want and perfect the world around us. That's still with us too. But those are not really the dominant features of our age. And those aren't the things driving it forward. We've actually left those behind and entered a new age. Well, this happened in really the 1940s, give or take. And in the 1940s, what happens? World War II ends. People look back on this project of modernism that man thinks he can achieve everything he wants, and they see it led to death and destruction and horrible atrocities. They start to rethink this. They also, through technology, begin to be exposed to all of these other cultures. And the secular mind, the, the unbelieving, ungodly mindset is trying to grapple with how this all works and how people in eastern parts of the world can function and think so differently than we think, and yet their cultures survive and exist. And the conclusion they come to is that truth is not an objective thing outside of you, but that it is a construct of your perception and experiences. And so in this type of mindset, no one has the edge on truth. Nobody has it to themselves, and every person has their own version of truth. And as long as we all just affirm each other and say, your version of reality is okay, and your version of reality is okay, we can all get along and sing Kumbaya, and one day we will reach that utopia where there is peace and justice and all of that stuff. Peace and justice to the secular world is not a biblical version of those things. But again, they have a vague idea of what they think they want, and they are going to work to try to get that. Postmodernism claims to give those types of promises. And so we ended off last time looking at just some of the things that we can see around us all throughout our culture. Some of these little sayings that people um, will say frequently that are very much postmodern. Things like your truth, uh, things like don't judge, um, all of those types of things have no biblical basis, but people say them all the time. Sometimes Christians even use that type of sloppy terminology, and it's not a biblical approach. That is postmodernism actively working in our world all around us. And here's the thing I have to again go back to. If you think that this is just some fringe theory and it doesn't have anything to do with you and you don't need to understand it, think again. Even if you don't recognize what it is, it is everywhere around you and it is affecting you and it is trying to put pressure on you to submit to its way of thinking. That's why we have to actively understand what the way of the world is. So we'll pick up on this discussion after we read from Ephesians chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves is it is the gift of God not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have um, opened up this path, the only path to eternal life, the only path to eternal riches and spiritual blessings, the only path to being seated in the heavenlies right now spiritually. That is the path through Christ, into Christ. Lord, we thank you that you have made this freely and openly available to every single person, that there is not some exclusive and elite group that has uh, this truth only to themselves, but that this objective message and truth is available to any person who will hear it, who will believe it. And Lord, I pray that As we study this passage, we would understand more about who we are, who we were before, who we are in Christ now, and who you are, that you are so merciful and gracious and loving and good. Lord, help us to rejoice in those things each and every day. We thank you and pray this in your name. Amen. So as we continue talking about postmodernism, there is one last topic And again, this is because postmodernism today is the main way of the world, the main course of this world, as Paul terms it in our passage. In trying to understand postmodernism and how it affects us, there is a reality we have to come to terms with, and that's that the church has no immunity to the way of the world. Now, we have the ability to overcome the way of the world, We cannot kid ourselves for a second to think that we are immune to its power and its presence and its influence among us. The world is very powerful, and Christians don't just automatically live the Christian life. Often, they can be influenced by worldly thinking. And so in discussing that, the last area where postmodernism has really shown itself and um, has affected our world is actually in the church itself. And we shouldn't be surprised by this. We should not be surprised by this at all. Because if we read what Scripture says, and I know there's a lot in Scripture, but especially being in the church age, we read the New Testament, we see that Paul was already talking about this type of thing being in the world and in the church in a coming day. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, among some other passages in which he deals with these types of things. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, notice what Paul says. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Paul warned about this very thing. Now, this is something that was already going on in the world at that time. But it seems that the way Paul lays this out, there's only sort of an exponential increase of this type of thing as time moves on. We have to take an honest look at the church that we see today, or what what many people call the church today, and ask ourselves, is this what's going on all around us, maybe even to some degree in our own thinking ourselves. We have to be honest with how postmodernism, how the way of the world can creep in and can affect us. Notice what Paul says in that passage. We can bring that back up, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Notice that he says that people, the, the time will come when they will not Notice the words he uses. Endure sound 
doctrine. That's odd terminology. Endure sound doctrine. Sound means healthy doctrine. Things that bring about good health. You think to yourself, it's a good thing. Why wouldn't anybody, why wouldn't everybody want this? But he uses a term to say it's a burden on them. This term's used a number of times in the New Testament. It's used by uh, it's used by Matthew of Jesus speaking, and it says in Matthew 17, 17, after his disciples failed to heal a boy who was possessed by a demon and throwing himself into the water and throwing himself into the fire. And the father brings him to Jesus and says, your disciples couldn't do anything for him. Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me and he heals him. The whole point is, obviously the, the disciples were lacking in faith and we're not doing the ministry, the messianic ministry that he had entrusted them, that by performing miracles, they would be testifying of the truth and authenticity of Jesus Christ. And so there was something lacking in them. And he realizes this is, this is, uh, I, I guess, epidemic in Israel at that time among that generation. But he says, how long shall I put up with you? The idea is, to have to bear with and be patient. It's like a toil to have to put up with this lack of faith. It's the same exact word we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, when Paul says, the time's going to come when they won't put up with, when they won't bear the burden of sound doctrine. You know what sound doctrine does? It creates a burden on people. It's a wonderful burden. It's a good burden but there is a load to bear when it comes to studying God's word and letting it, no, actively going to it and it doing work in us and the demands it makes on us and the way that it shapes and changes our thinking. This is not a passive process. You don't accidentally grow spiritually. It doesn't happen. The word of God does the work in us and it is a burden on us. Again, it's a wonderful burden. I'll compare it to this. Think of how many things in life are a burden that has good results. In fact, I would argue probably everything in this world that is good, everything that is beneficial and productive requires a great deal of the person involved with it. If you want to eat, now we live in times that are really better than any other time in human history, so it's much easier on us. But in the past, if you wanted to eat the best and eat good food, there was a great burden to getting there. If you want to be a healthy person, that doesn't happen normally accidentally. There's work that has to go into that. If you want to learn a skill, think a musical instrument, people that excel in that pour so much time in, of their lives into that to excel in that skill. You know what the doctrine of Scripture and its effects on us tells us? That when we go to Scripture, there is going to have to be active engagement with what it says, studying what it says, and allowing the Holy Spirit to apply it to our lives. This is an active process. Nobody grows spiritually through the process of osmosis. It doesn't happen. And yet the church would tell you today, that's almost exclusively how it happens. No, we have to go to Scripture, and it will do this work in us. So there's coming a time when people will not put up with that. They will not endure that. It's too difficult for them. And instead, they want something else. And before I get there, notice that it says they, for the time will come when they, See that word there? Who is they? Who does they refer to? This is another thing. I think a lot of people read this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4, and they just assume that's the other person, that's the unsaved, that's the wicked people, and they don't realize Paul has just said, preach the word. Who would Timothy be preaching to? Earlier in just a couple chapters before, 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul tells him, raise up 
other men, train other men so that they can train others also. Who is Timothy going to be preaching to? Any person who is in his audience. Any person who can hear the word of God, any person who can possibly hear what scripture has to say is they. They are a part of that group. And that tells us every single one of us potentially could be those who want to have our ears itched or tickled and would not endure sound doctrine. We cannot presume, we cannot assume that we are, a, a, that we are immune to this, that our congregation can't fall into this type of thing. Anyone can. Any congregation can. And it is only by enduring sound doctrine that we will not succumb to this type of thing. He says what they will do instead of enduring sound doctrine is have their itching ears tickled. And this is really strange terminology because the term for itch isn't used anywhere else in the Bible. It's the only time it's ever used. Even in the Old Testament, when they translated it from Hebrew to Greek, it's never used. But it's, it seems to come from a word that means somebody who does laundry. Now, I haven't seen a good explanation for this. The only thing I can assume is there's a few usages of it in the Old Testament. There's a few usages of the root word, not this specific word. So this comes from another word. But the word for someone who's doing laundry or dealing with um, refining cloth and that type of thing, it seems that the connection is, this is a bit of an assumption, but I think there's at least a, a logical connection here. It seems to be that it's this massaging motion that takes place with the clothes to clean them and refine them. And so something about that started to be used to refer to people being tickled or itched. And some contexts seem to use this in uh, a, a way where uh, not biblical context, I'm talking like extra biblical Greek literature that's used a few times in some other places, where somebody has some type of rash or some type of skin disease, and it's like this insatiable, almost a pain where they, they almost can't keep themselves from itching it. It's that type of thing. They are compelled to itch. And if you think, if you've ever had, I don't know, like poison ivy, poison oak, things like that, um, even other types of conditions, probably the worst thing you could do is give in to that urge and just, I'm going to just scratch it. And then what do you have? You have a festering, pussing wound. It's disgusting. There's nothing good about that. It seems that that's kind of the picture that he's talking about is these people, they just want what they want. I have an itch that needs to be scratched. No, it doesn't need to. I think it needs to. And I'm going to do anything I can to get what I want. And this tells me that built within us, because of sin, because of the sin nature and its work in us, oftentimes the things we think we want, even from scripture, even in preaching, the things we think we want might not always be what we need. We have to be open to the possibility that sometimes we're going to hear things that I don't really want to hear, but I need to hear. This is good for me, and this is healthy. That's a part of the ministry that is built out from Scripture, that the Bible lays out in what preaching the Word is. The problem is when people give in to itching ears and they go that path, it actually has destructive consequences. Notice just one example of this, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Peter 2 Verse 1 says, but false prophets also arose among the people. So that's what happened in the past, just as, and now Peter's going to make a prophetic statement about something that's going to happen, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Do we grasp that doctrine and what scripture teaches matters so much that if we twist it or we mess with it or we ignore it or we only get what we want to hear, there can be literally destructive ends to that. 
It's a very serious thing. And we do not want to play around with the way of the world and letting it influence our own personal thinking, our church's thinking, and the body of Christ as a whole. We have to be proactive and pushing back against this type of thinking. So just how has the way of the world infected the church and made it succumb to worldly thinking and just wanting to have teachers that tell people what they want to hear? Well, there's a few different areas that the church has um, engaged in that I think are very much a part of this way of the world, the postmodern mindset. And again, the postmodern mindset is, I have truth that I've constructed, you have truth that you've constructed, and let's just all get along, and we must affirm and accept each person's version of truth. How has that infected the church? The first way that I could very much see, and there's, this list could go on and on and on, I'm going to hit the biggest areas that the church today is being affected by postmodernism. And the first is this undying desire to be diverse. Diversity at all costs. Diversity this, diversity that. It is, in some people's minds, the most important thing there is. And it actually is very bad in most contexts. Diversity is necessary because if you are going to have each person allowed to, in their own thinking, construct their own version of truth, there is no way they're all going to agree. So you have to have diversity. Right there, if you're going to allow that type of mindset, you have to say, we must be diverse. We must be multi this and multi that. We have to have everything and everything has a say and no one's above anyone and everything's equal. And so diversity is a demand of the postmodern mindset. Now, don't get me wrong. Variety is not a bad thing. God has built variety into the world. Variety can be a very good thing, but variety is not a virtue in and of itself. Variety is only as good as the thing that you are talking about. So this idea that diversity at all costs and in all contexts, and this is our highest priority, is a major mistake. Oftentimes, the only thing people can do when they say that, especially in churches, we want a diverse church, the only thing they can do is artificially manufacture it. And that's, there's nothing true or real about that. Diversity can't be manufactured, shouldn't be manufactured. If it's there, and we're talking, at least at this point, we're talking ethnic diversity. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a wonderful thing. But it's not a virtue in and of itself. And we shouldn't expect that every single place you go around the globe, we have to have this artificially manufactured quota, must be this many people, must be this many people. That's, that's a fruitless end. There is nothing good about that. So often diversity, this is the bait and switch that's used. Often diversity is propped up using ethnic terms because there is nothing more socially taboo than saying anything negative about ethnic diversity. That is, you can't say it in our culture today. So they use that because that is something that the spirit of the age, the way of the world has decided is one of their highest virtues they will say, well, are you against ethnic diversity? You must be racist if you don't want a diverse church, if you don't want a diverse this and a diverse that. But the bait and switches, they're never actually talking about ethnic diversity. See, ethnicity is something that God has built into mankind. It serves a purpose. It's something God obviously wants. And people are all made in the image of God. Every single person. But culture is not all equal. What people do with the creation and their way of thinking and building a society, not all of those societies are equal. Just so happens that culture often is strongly tied in with ethnic background. So the bait and switch is always talk about it like it's an ethnic thing when really you're always meaning a cultural thing. And really you want every possible proposition and thought and cultural idea to have 
a voice in whatever context you're talking about. It's a way of getting falsehood to have equal say in any environment. I'm not just making this up. This isn't something that I've just dreamed up. There's probably a lot of places I could go, but one person, I found this article really interesting. His name is Roy Clements. Probably not a person that most or any of us would know in the United States, but he was actually, up until 1999, he was like the rising star in the British Evangelical Church. He was friends with John Stott. He was being groomed to really be the kingpin of evangelicalism over there. And then it came out in 1999 that he was a homosexual, and his wife left him. And then he began to feel like he was mistreated because the evangelical church said, we will not permit this type of thing. So notice what he says in discussing this topic. He says, I wish I could tell you that over the years, the Christian church has, had learned to affirm diversity in the way that the New Testament so repeatedly urges us to do. There's some assumptions in there, but notice where he's starting. We need to affirm diversity. This is a good thing. But sadly, our record is very patchy in this regard. As I look around the Christian scene, for instance, I see many churches with very clear ethnic identities. He's focusing on ethnicity as what diversity is. But very soon the topic changes. Uh, I'm going to skip down for the sake of our time. He then says, and so this is later in the article, and most pertinent to many of us, because he's speaking to a group of homosexuals, why is it that homosexuals feel so alienated from the church and from evangelical Bible teaching churches most of all? Why are we made to feel like second-class citizens who don't really belong? Did you see what he did there? He starts the discussion off on, we need to be an ethnically diverse church. That's the highest virtue. Don't we all know that? That's what our society has decided. And then it quickly turns into every single person's ideas need to have a voice in the church and in any church context. That's extremely dangerous. You know, the Bible has an antidote to this type of thinking. It's very clear on this. When Paul was writing to the Philippians to encourage them to make others more important to themselves, to have the attitude of Christ, to regard others more highly than themselves, in that discussion in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. That is narrow. You know what Paul says? Rather than diversity, he says unity. And most of the time, you'll hear people talk about unity, unity, unity. But guess what the unity never means? Think the same way. Paul literally says twice, think the same. Think one. That's extremely narrow. And that's totally right and biblical. The church, people in the church, should be conforming to the standard of the word of God. That means we're going to have to take all of our really bad and wrong thinking and begin conforming to what God's word says. And in doing that, we will be of one mind and one purpose. It's not an instantaneous process. That takes exposure to God's word and studying it and growing in it. But that is the goal, is unity around truth, not some false um, stitch together unity where everybody thinks completely differently. They're all going in different directions, but they somehow all get along. So we're calling it unity. That's not biblical unity. This is what unity is. Just by way of example, think about this. If you and a church filled with a bunch of people who think all these different things and they all have their own constructed truth, if you were to have a person come up to you, a group of people, and that person asked you, what must I do to be saved? You have all these different people. We are unified because we all get along. That's all they mean by it. We all get along. But we're diverse in how we think and what we do. 
they're going to give them answers that make no sense whatsoever. Just look on, I, I actually I would argue, don't do this. Don't look on the internet for answers to that question because you're going to find a lot of confusion out there. Many, many people, many, many websites are going to be convincing you, you need to be water baptized to be saved. If you don't do this, you can't receive salvation. Why does Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm glad that I didn't baptize any of you because I wasn't sent to baptize. I was sent to proclaim the gospel. The gospel, the thing that saves, and baptism are completely distinct. Baptism has a place, but not in salvation. Oh, but if you're in a diverse church where everybody gets along and everybody's opinions are heard, suddenly one person saying you have to be water baptized, another person saying you have to go up to the altar, you have to pray a prayer, you have to do all of these things. When the Bible, the answer is believe in Jesus Christ alone. Those other answers don't matter. They're all false. And there is no point in trying to construct some unity around error and letting that have an equal voice. And again, I just have to say this because it could be easily misunderstood. I'm not saying everybody is a completed project and understands every single word the Bible says. This is a growth process, but it must always be back to what Scripture says. This is our source. This is our standard. The next area that logically follows from diversity is this thing called tolerance that people are obsessed with in our society, that we must tolerate everything and put up with everything. And again, if you're going to have all of these ideas and opinions, each person gets to decide their version of truth, then if you're going to all congregate together and try to, in some semblance of mission, be working together, I don't even know how that could possibly work, but then you're going to have to come up with something where you agree that every single person's views are valid and you must, by that definition, then be tolerant of them. The word tolerance is often misused, but just going off of that type of definition or that type of thinking, because tolerance often means bearing with things that are uncomfortable or you don't agree with, but in this version, it actually speaks more like the way that postmodernism uses it. It speaks more along the lines of um, affirming things that are different or you would disagree with. In this type of worldview where tolerance is a virtue, you, to have a diverse church, to have a diverse world, you must tolerate every single thing around you and affirm everything around you. There's a paradox that enters, and you can't escape it. It is there if people want to tolerate all these views and all of this error. And a, a man named Karl Popper, now he's passed away, but he's amazingly influential, even though he's by no means a household name. Very influential. So much so that his book on the Open Society, which was published in 1945, is actually one of his students was so impacted by it he has become one of the biggest political donors in American history. George Soros was very influenced by Karl Popper and has adopted many of his ideas. And Karl Popper believed in this open society where everyone gets to coexist and we all get to get along even though we're totally different and have sometimes exclusive views about reality. And here's what he said in this open society type of thinking. He said, Unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance even to those who are intolerant, we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant. Then the tolerant will be destroyed and the tolerance with them. You can't get around it. At some point, you're going to have to be intolerant of something and say, no, we're not putting up with this. Even those who are obsessed with tolerance, draw a line at some point and say, enough. And then what happens to them? They no longer believe in the virtue that they claim to believe in in the first place because they just became intolerant of something. An example of how this has affected the church, and this is an egregious example. However, I have to say, there are others that I didn't even want to recite the words 
about these accounts and what's happened. The wickedness that has taken place in the modern church is so egregious and awful. This is one that is actually toned down to some degree for how much people put up with in the modern church. There's a woman named Dawn Bennett, and two, let me think, actually, no, it's longer than that, about four years ago now, she was ordained into the ELCA. The ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, is a mainline denomination. It is, if you hear mainline, you can assume, very, very liberal, and it has long ago departed from what Scripture says. Remember, the Lutherans, uh, for any other doctrinal faults I could have with them, and there are some, uh, they started from a place where a man named Martin Luther was so committed to what God's word said that he would stand before a council at the Diet of Worms and oppose the Roman Catholic Church, a very all-powerful institution on the earth, and be chased out, running for his life, and have to hide out for 10 months in Wartburg Castle just so that he wasn't killed. That man is really the one who gave birth to Lutheranism, whether it was his decision or not. These churches, this type of thinking came from there. And all these years later, the ELCA looks at the Bible and basically says, none of it is true. It's only as good as it promotes some social justice agenda. And that's all they use it for. Well. In that denomination, the ELCA, their homosexual bishop in Nashville ordained Don Bennett. We should realize there's some problems there considering 1 Timothy chapter 2 makes it clear. Women are not to preach and teach and exercise authority over men. Our culture cannot like that. That's what the Bible says. There's already a problem there. That would be, just in the scope of things, it would seem kind of minor. But not only that, When she isn't out marching topless with some pride parade somewhere, she was at this ordination with a group known as the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, a group of men who dress up in women's drag as nuns and paint their faces these ghoulish look that they put on there and go and they mock specifically Roman Catholicism. And I understand... uh, I don't believe the Roman Catholic Church is right. I believe it has tons of error. But their point really is to mock Christianity and to be absolutely disgusting about how they do it. And they happen to not just be at her ordination. They were up front with her, participating in it. This is an example. We can think to ourselves, no way, it can never get that bad. The church will never slide that much. Yes, it will. It's doing it in real time. This is not an isolated incident. This perversion is everywhere in America and in Christianity. And what did the Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when he saw the Corinthian church allowing very deviant sexual perversion to take place among them? He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 2, You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. There does come a time. Again, I'm not talking about that every person who struggles with sin. I struggle with sin. Every person does. But not every struggle with sin is the same and is on the same level. I'm not talking about just any time somebody sins and People become aware of it. Oh, you're out. We're kicking you out. You're no longer a part of this. No, but we do not tolerate perversion. God's word doesn't tolerate it. And there's a proper way to deal with this. And when the church allows the world and the influence of the world to come in and put pressure on us, it's only a generation, maybe two generations, if you're lucky, before this type of sickness is actually in your church. There has to be an understanding of just how destructive postmodernism is on the church today. And as usual, I have not covered as much ground as I would like, so I will pick up on these next week. But I hope you see a couple of things. Number one, I hope you see what God has saved us from, the way the world thinks. 
We don't have to think that way. We have the mind of Christ right here in Scripture, and we can go to it every single day, anytime we want to, to learn about truth. But also so that we would see exactly just what's going on in churches around us, and we'd be able to fortify ourselves against that type of thinking. We want to serve the Lord. We want to do it honestly. We always want to submit to what his word says. That's going to come with sometimes drawing lines and taking tough stands. I hope we're always willing to do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are active and at work in this world and that you are still saving people. You are still discipling people. Your word is still serving a purpose and it's powerful and it can guide us each and every day. And Lord, even though um, the world around us is losing its mind and telling us that we are antiquated and backwards, Lord, thank you that you are the creator, you are sovereign over all, and that we can always trust you. So when you say something that contradicts the culture, we can always, without question, trust what it says. Thank you for that guidance. Thank you for that truth. Help us to live out what your word says, and we pray this in your name. Amen.